Greetings in the name of the triune God, the God who is really always with us. I am Debbie Bartley, honored to serve as one of First St. Charles' associate pastors. So our picnic table is still set and we are ready to invite you to join us. I pray you have been transformed as together we have studied Bishop Karen Olivedo's book, Together at the Table. I know I have been transformed, and I pray for continued transformation in myself and for all of us. So last time I left you with another empathy exercise. I asked you to look at someone for whom you might be ready to make an unkind judgment and tell yourself, she is someone's daughter. She is someone's daughter. She is someone's daughter. How did it go? Please share your comments in the, your stories in the comments. So this session, we are going to consider Bishop Olivedo's thought that unity is not uniformity. And then finally, we're going to study her book's final chapter entitled, We Eat With People We Love. Hmm. So let's begin with the bishop's thought that unity is not uniformity. Now, I got to admit, at first blush, this does not make sense to me. Doesn't everyone have to believe the same as me if we're going to exist in unity? What do you think? Well, the bishop states that uniformity is often misunderstood as unity. My thoughts exactly. But she goes on to explain that uniformity is a state of homogeneity where there is the appearance of sameness and it runs the risk of banishing those who are not the same or in full agreement. Unity, on the other hand, doesn't erase differences or disagreement. It requires a willingness to live with ambiguity while acknowledging our individuality. Now there's that ambiguity word again, isn't it? So the bishop reminds us of John Wesley's words. John Wesley was one of the founders of Methodism. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, charity. Sounds reasonable, doesn't it? Yet to put it into practice is not always so easy. At the heart of our United Methodist Church's struggle over persons' gender orientation and gender identities, the bishop asserts, is people taking a non-essential, a position on homosexuality, and raising it to an essential on par with our understanding of the Trinity, the role of sacraments, salvation through Jesus Christ, and so on. Now, whoa, that is a lot to think about, isn't it? The heart of her statement, in my words, not hers, is, what does our gender have to do with the essential beliefs of our faith. For others, it could also be, what does the color of my skin have to do with the essential beliefs of our faith? Now that's a good question to ponder. And the next is, quoting Bishop Olivedo, when did we decide that some parts of the body of Christ were either less worthy of honor or even unwanted? Why do we exclude parts of the body simply because they aren't really like us? My question is, if we are all beloved children of God, created in God's image, are we not all worthy? So the bishop begins her final chapter, We Eat With People We Love, by sharing that she is often asked the question, why do you stay in a denomination that is hostile to LGBTQ people? Others who do not support her episcopacy, and obviously not her personhood, flat out tell her, you need to leave the United Methodist Church. Ouch. So what is the bishop's answer? What does, why does she stay? She says that it's because it's her spiritual home. It's the church that made a promise to her at her baptism where we are all brought into union with Christ, with each other, 
and with the church, our inequality in Christ is made manifest. But then she shares the belief in the United Methodist Church that homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. When she hears that, she knows that a pronouncement is made upon her life that separates her from community, that community of faith that made a promise to her in her baptism, a promise of unity and a promise of loving her. She states that the church broke its promises to her. So she also shared that through several of the denomination's general conferences of her experiences, at which one conference a young LGBTQ person said to her through his tears, why do they hate us so? My heart breaks. How about yours? So together at the table, the gist of it is we don't have to be in uniformity to be in unity, to come to the table. So let's reflect over the power of sharing communion. Communion creates community. We are reminded through the liturgy that we are called to a life of connection, of one with Christ and one with each other. Are those words we just hear, or are those words, my friends, that we honor and follow? I'd like to read the final paragraphs from the bishop's book. May love propel us to move from segregated tables to those that bring us face to face with one another, so that the face of God becomes more visible. May love give us the capacity to extend community beyond the borders we currently have in place, so we can join hands with our brothers, our sisters, our siblings. At the table, enemies become friends, strangers become companions, and community is established and affirmed. Differences are not diminished, but are welcomed. Across lines of differences, healthy community is formed through the sharing of life together. Our ability to have empathy strengthens our ability to love those who are not like us, even when we disagree. May we learn to stay at the table together. Maybe you have agreed with me some, a lot, or not at all. Maybe you're not even sure how you feel or what you think. Maybe you're someone who needs to become better at offering empathy to others. Maybe your heart could be open a little more. Or maybe you're someone who needs to receive empathy from others. That you have been hurt by the actions and words of others or unable to fully be yourself or be as transparent as you want to be. Well, I want to close this devotional series with my go-to song for either when I find myself feeling unworthy or when I find myself feeling judgmental about someone who is different from me. And then I've got an empathy exercise to use with the video. So I have provided you with a link to the song, This Is Me, from the movie The Greatest Showman, my go-to song. And here's what I'd like for you to do. Watch the video in its entirety, just absorbing it in visually and audibly. Then after watching it, ask yourself, how am I feeling? What judgments did you make? Did it make you uncomfortable? Did you want to stop it and not watch it? Did you want to just keep playing it over and over again? Did you find it encouraging and strength giving to you that you are a worthy child of God? Did you find it convicting and that you needed to open your heart a little bit more to the worth of someone different from you? Well, after naming your feelings and your thoughts, pray to God, naming all of this, and pray to God for God's help as you process your feelings and thoughts. And then, Watch the video again and again, just 
absorb it into your soul and repeat as often as necessary. My friends, may we all be free to say, this is me. This is me without worrying about what someone else is going to say or do. This is me knowing that I am loved and accepted by God and by everyone else. So I have enjoyed this journey with you, and it is not the end. I've attached some devotion, some resources to this devotional, and it will find it useful, hopefully, on your life journeys, because we will continue individually and together. Let's pray. Dear God, help us to be the children that you know that we are, to love all of your children just like you love us. Teach us to be one with each other in Christ and with you and in ministry together. We know that we can do this through your help and through your grace. And we ask and pray all of this in your son Jesus' holy name. Amen. So friends, let's invite everyone to the table so that everyone can know God's love, so that everyone know that they are worthy children of God. Let's stay safe. Let's stay connected to each other and connected to God. And let's share God's love and grace with everyone today, tomorrow, and every day. God bless.